So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I will uh, now um, present Baya Shehab. Uh, she will do a presentation uh, that's named From Cairo. I know why the caged birds th sing. Um, just a uh, small presentation of Baya. Um, she's um, an artist, designer, art historian. Uh, she's associate professor of design and, and founder of the graphic design program at the American University in Cairo, where she has developed a full design curriculum, mainly focused on visual culture of the Arab world. Her artwork has been on display in many exhibitions. Um, she's focused on street art uh, as it was an instrumental um, in the Egyptian uprising um, that we all know. The, the presentation uh, will be addressing uh, precisely the Egyptian uh, uprising voices that chanted in Tahir Square. Um, she, since 2014, had, has been painting poetry in different walls in different cities around the world. Um, Baya uh, will do her presentation during about 20 minutes, and after that she will present a movie that will be premiered here. And after the movie there will be questions and answers um, directed by Mikkel that did the presentation in the beginning of the, the, the afternoon today. So I uh, welcome Baya. Please come, Baya. Yeah. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. This is what Tahrir Square looks like right now. We have this uh, phallic pole in the middle with a big flying flag, a lot of surveillance cameras, and this is what the government wants you to think uh, Cairo looks like. There are no demonstrators, it's peaceful, and it's great for tourism. But if you can see that little wall in the back, two years ago, an artist painted this last year, actually. And it reads, uh, why do you need another revolution? If you look closely at the symbols, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the way Quran is written, which is the um, holy Islamic book. We have these symbols around ayahs, signifying that they are holy verses. And this was actually something that was said by our president. So this is an intervention by a brilliant street artist. His name is Ammar Abu Bakr. I will be showing you what's going on on the streets in Cairo and how people are, are resisting uh, after the coup and after the current dictatorship, how are we finding ways to channel ideas that we believed in during the revolution? So if you see that little Mickey Mouse symbol, this, so if you live in Cairo, you would know that this is a quote from, a, from the president, and the Mickey Mouse actually is this. This was, unfortunately, Amr was jailed for three years for a meme that was shared on Twitter. We have over 40,000 political prisoners right now, even more, this is the declared number. This was also being circulated about, you know, the Follow Me campaign. Well, the Follow Me to Egypt has a policeman and the cuffs on them. A brilliant uh, street artist who was also practicing uh, during the revolution took this meme and created an online campaign. Uh, because the, because the, the student was jailed, uh, so other artists were spreading the message online. Obviously, as you can see, Genzir currently lives in Los Angeles. He doesn't live in Cairo anymore. He had to leave. So there are, we have many activists in prison. This is Ala Abdel Fattah. He's still in prison. Prison, his sister who's standing next to him, Sana, 
please remember her. We will be talking about her. She's, she's also, she also served uh, uh, two prison sentences for being, uh, f both of them being outspoken uh, during the revolution and being revolutionary re leaders. Ahmad Dumas was sentenced uh, for prison in life. He got a life sentence. These are all people who are Nurha, uh, uh, Mahinur finished her sentence late last year. She's out now. She was a, a lawyer from Alexandria. So these, are, these young men and women are the faces of the revolution. This is a caricature by the really amazing Dua Al Adl. She is a, she's a cartoonist. And the quote up there reads, no to prison, no to imprisonment of Fatma, Islam, and Nagi, no to imprisonment of the intellectuals. So who are Fatma, Islam, and Nagi? Fatma Naoud got three years in jail for insulting Islam in her writing. Ahmad Nagi is serving a prison sentence also for authoring a novel. And uh, finally, Gawish was not, uh, did not serve, but he was detained for a few days. So we face this every day. Is it killing creative expression? And Dil lives in Cairo, and he's still putting out these cartoons, and I p p really worry for him because he's not afraid of putting these, circulating these cartoons. I think they're clear. The, the, the illustration on the upper left-hand side reads, uh, fuck the revolution and fuck those who did it. And the, the one below it um, is actually, we had a young woman shot on the anniversary of the revolution. And uh, this cartoon marks that. And finally, the pharaoh being uh, so Cairo Key is, a, is another band. They, they, they put out a song. It's called The Last Song. This was also March 2016. All you can see in the video is them walking on a, on, a train, on a train track, just the band walking on a train track. And they're singing, but you cannot, you see flashes, but you can't really see. So they had subliminal messages. Within hours of this uh, video being online, Activists took screen captured, uh, captures and decoded the hidden messages in the video. And um, the script is about, uh, really, we did a revolution. It's still going on. Uh, we know who the criminal, uh, criminals are. But if anybody's watching the video, you really need to pause. They have the faces of everybody who's involved in the corruption, all the previous current presidents and military men. And then they also have images of the street art that was on the street during the revolution. All this is embedded in, into the song that was uploaded on YouTube. And this was last year. We also have a brilliant comedian. His name is Basim Youssef. Basim Youssef has a big hit show during the revolution. It was a YouTube show. And then he became mainstream. And the minute uh, the military dictatorship came into power, he went into exile because he was getting death threats. Now he has a documentary out, it's called Tickling Giants, and it documents his story. So uh, I think this is another form of uh, resistance. Finally, some, uh, a story on, on a street artist, Ammar is the person I told you about. This is a mural, this is Sana sitting on the upper right hand side. She is the activist that was in prison. He drew her in downtown Cairo. And then when she went to prison again, he started painting her in different cities. This was in Berlin. This is in another city. So he, and in 2016, she wore a jacket that, she wore a jacket that reads, we still have a revolution.
and she walked on the streets of Cairo alone in downtown. So Amar took her picture and he also started painting that picture around the world. So, so <laughs> I'm a historian. I had nothing to do with the revolution. I study epigraphy, which is writing on Islamic artifacts across different historic dynasties. And in 2010, I was invited to produce an artwork at a museum um, in Germany. And they told me I can do whatever I want as long as it was in the Arabic script. So for an audience in Europe who could not read Arabic, I decided I have one message. If I'm going to say anything to the world, I want to say no. And I'm going to say no a thousand different times. So I collected a thousand different no's, documented them chronologically over a period of 1,400 years from Spain to China on buildings, on textiles, on wood, on everything. And I created an installation. It's a seven meter installation that had all the different no letters in Arabic. And when the revolution started, I saw this image of uh, dead men being dragged over garbage. Nine months into the revolution, I was documenting as a historian, but then there comes a point where you feel you either join them or, or you are worthless. So I decided to go down to the street because that was my way of helping, and I had a thousand no's to use, so I started creating stencils with these no. So, no to military rule was the first stencil I ever sprayed. No to emergency law. No to military trials. No to a new pharaoh. No to stealing the revolution. No to snipers. No to bullets. No to tear gas. No to sectarian division. No to violence. No to killing, no to burning books, no to stripping the people, no to barrier walls. And I started spraying these no's all over Cairo on, on different walls with different artists. And I was surprised when I came here that they told me it's violent to spray over somebody else's art. In Cairo, there was a sort of camaraderie between us. We were it was a compliment if some other artists sprayed on my wall because we were, we were fighting for the same cause. We have the same message. I'm, it's not about vandalism, it's about f believing in something and fighting for it. And if I learned one thing was that I belonged to this bigger brain hive where we, every time there was something happening, we would all rush down to the street at the same minute and spray the same message in different styles. So after the No campaign, I was on the streets uh, for two years. I sprayed many others, but this one is a special wall for me. It's the first wall I ever painted. It's a barrier wall, wall, barrier wall in downtown Cairo in front of the Ministry of Interior where they used to send the snipers out. And these walls, they were all over Cairo. And after I painted that wall in 2011, 2012, there was a group of activists who painted on all of the walls in downtown Cairo, a campaign that was called There Are No Walls. And they got a music bands, and they sang, and they danced on the street, pretending that the walls have disappeared. But a year later, I go back to my wall, and the wall is still there. So. As you can see, uh, the artist painted the perspective of the street with the Ministry of Interior at the end of the street. So there was a, an accident. A bus with 52 children going to school was hit by a train. And at the time, I thought we had a new president, so this should be different. The Muslim Brotherhood were in power, and this was their chance to prove that they can improve the country. But it felt like nothing had changed. So I took the names of the 52 children and I started painting them on the streets in Cairo with their backpacks as if they're going to school. So they're playing, they're singing. So on this wall, they're playing hide and seek. So the first child is saying, 
Chalawis, are we done? Can we come out? The other one says, Lisa, not yet. The third one says, has the revolution succeeded? The fourth one says, Lisa, not yet. Have we got the rights of our martyrs? Lisa, not yet. Has Egypt become heaven on earth? Lisa, not yet. This is uh, a, a little girl who, who I painted on a wall that is owned by Princess Noura Al Saud in the middle of Cairo. And the girl is saying, I wish I grew up to be a princess. Uh, obviously, the wall was covered the next morning. And these children were spread all over Cairo. They're singing children's songs. They're dreaming of a better future. And this is an example of where uh, artists play with each other. There's a, there was a campaign called Coloring Through Corruption by a group, group of activists where they just take empty walls and they color rainbows. So I added my children to their walls and the artist directly contacted me thanking me because it was, it was nice for us to play together on the street. But I left the bubbles empty for people who are passing by to fill their own dreams into the bubbles. And that's a different story for a different day. There was lots of interesting intervention between military and Islamists on these walls. So, um, this is what the walls look like now. Everything has been whitewashed. Um, this is the last thing I painted in Cairo. It was um, for the aggressive sexual harassment campaigns uh, against women. Um, so there you were organized. Um, sexual assault rings where 10 men would surround one woman while they're raping her one man would be standing outside telling everybody that it's okay they're trying to help her while the woman is being raped on the street so um, and in Islam they say a woman is a awra awra means that she should be covered so her face should be covered her hair is awra her voice is awra the arms are aura. So, so I painted this uh, brain with naked women and the slogan that reads, reads your brain is aura. So that was the last thing I did in Cairo. And then two years later, this is, this is the tank wall. This is what it looks like now. Everything is white. And I couldn't work on the street, obviously, because it's uh, four years in prison. So. I decided to go to Freiburg in Germany and start painting a new set of no's. Um, I was no longer only concerned with my locality, but with uh, even broader issues of how we are portrayed as Arabs around the world. So I painted no to extremism, no to racism, no to blood, no to war, no to borders, no to discrimination, no to hatred, no to killing, no to stupidity. <laughs> not to colorism, not to violence. And these were officially sprayed on, on as part of a show. Um, we left a barcode for people passing by. But I also did some illegal interventions, obviously, because it's fun. And <laughs> it was um, different places in Freiburg. And the street art community there is really very vibrant and interesting. So it was nice to see that they have 12 legal walls. That was really nice to see for the first time. This is, was also an intervention in New Orleans. It's in the uh, Bywater area. This is in Vancouver. And in Turkey, I love Turkey because in Istanbul, it's the only place in the world where I'm walking down the street with my stencil. A guy puts his head out of a door and tells me, do you want to spray inside? But you don't know me. Yes, come spray inside anyway. So he took me up to his terrace and I sprayed this for him. And it happened twice on one afternoon. So it was nice to see that in Istanbul. After painting No, I felt that I will keep painting no, but I really want to say other things. So uh, I started painting poetry by Mahmoud Darwish. And this is the first one I painted. It was in Vancouver. It reads, stand at the corner of a dream and fight. The next one I painted in New York. It's for the girls who were imprisoned, the, the young activists. It's a, a poem about imprisoned uh, butterflies. This was in Madison, 
It reads no to the impo impossible. This is in Beirut. It reads my country is not a suitcase. This is in Marrakesh. We love life if we had access to it. This is in Tokyo. On this earth, there are things worth living for. This is in Kefalonia, for in Greece, for the people who are drowning at sea. Those who have no land have no sea. This was in Amsterdam. One day we will be who we want to be. The journey has not started and the road has not ended. So my final, okay, my wall here is going to be, uh, we're going to put it out tomorrow. And it's also a poem by Derwish. I hope you will visit it. Thank you. Baya, maybe you, you can come here and for some questions and or. But do you want to screen the movie first? We've, we yeah. We, yeah. The movie first. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I will be. I was really very very lucky to have uh, one crazy American director who's just crazy. He took a camera and he came to Cairo and he wanted to shoot an interview with me. I didn't think much of it at the time. When Mark walked into my studio with two big cameras, I was saying, oh, another interview. And Mark took the footage. He interviewed other women. And he created doc a documentary that I'm really grateful he did, because if he didn't do it, we wouldn't have a story. So I'm going to leave you with Nefertiti's Daughters. It's, um, it documents a part of our struggle at a point in history where we thought we had a chance. So uh, enjoy it and I'll join you later for a discussion. Oh. حظي نصيبي فين اروح له اشكي له حالي اه ان شكيت قلبي وحاسي يعملوا امر علي Humanity has been communicating on walls ever since its inception. So the caveman painted on the wall, uh, the pharaohs painted on the walls. So there's, we relate to the wall on a very <laughs> um, primitive, in a very primitive form as a, as a humanity. But in our case as street artists, the, the, street are, um, the street is the place where you can reach the people directly. So even if the media is broadcasting messages on TV um, and on the radio, uh, you still have access to the people on the street. So you use, use the street as your canvas, um, as the canvas to communicate your message with the people.
I think revolutions are begotten in the streets. Uh, that many times with upheavals and other social movements, the kind of creative activity, uh, the kind of artistic activity that you see is, is quite literally born outside, not in the rarefied offices of, for example, political leader or maybe a fine artist. So you have a street poetic to many of these creative forms of dissent during moments of revolution because even though we might speak of Twitter and Facebook, a revolution doesn't happen without a massive amount of bodies in public space. Street art is an alternative way for people to express themselves when they live in a repressed, oppressed society. Uh, that always happens. Under Mubarak, we couldn't do that because the one person who wrote no to succession on the wall got taken away from his home in the middle of the night and detained. So there was no means of expression. But again, with the revolution came this outburst of free expression, people wanting to express their views and thoughts and share them publicly. And one way they're doing that is on the walls. I didn't go to work in the street so I didn't do street art or I didn't be a fan of the street. I'm a believer in the street because I'm a believer in the street. And I see that the street is the place where any person can be in. So what you're presenting is حتى لو هو مش مباشر يعني حتى لو هو مش مباشر ضد حاجة معينة فهو رد على 30 سنة أو أكتر من 30 سنة المجتمع بينهار فهو نوع من التعبير بتاع الناس في الأول في الآخر أنا مش نزل على الحيطة عشان أقول للناس أنا فاهم أكتر منكو وأنا بوجهكو لا ده غلط خالص أنا بحاول ألم صوت الناس الحقيقي مش صوت النشطة ولا صوت السياسيين ولا صوت الإعلام ون... و... ونقول ده على الحيط the state has the tanks, has the rifles, has the tear gas. Uh, the opposition has another kind of armament, which is um, street art. And in fact, many street artists refer to their spray cans and their paints as weapons. Um, they can go around public space and bomb it uh, with messages. It's not a weaponry that's based on inflicting physical violence. It's a kind of weapon that's a rhetorical device that can be alluring and mobilizing. I was um, asked to develop an artwork in Arabic, in using the Arabic language. And uh, at that time, in 2010, I felt the need to say no in Arabic. My message was to say no. Uh, so I looked for a thousand different no's on everything produced under Islamic or Arab patronage in the past uh, 1,400 years. And I documented them in a book. And the installation uh, was exhibited in September of 2010 in Munich, Germany. And what was um, really interesting at the time was the realization of what these no meant and how empowering it was to, uh, to see them all together, to see one letter take so many shapes and forms and uh, to be utilized in so many different ways, it gave me a very strong sense of history of where I, of where I came from. Um, and then when the revolution started, um, for nine months I was uh, a historian, simply documenting uh, what was going on around me. I did not feel I could uh, be part of the revolution at the time. Um, it was um, violent, it was... Um, the images we were consuming was what was... Uh, what made this shift, and I showed it several times, uh, this one image of... Um, uh, the dead people that are uh, thrown um, with the garbage on the street, and they're... And after nine months of consuming uh, images of brutality, uh, against civilians, and you, you, you keep seeing these images over in videos and over and over again. Even if you're reading in the news that these things don't exist, but you are seeing them now, you have to believe it. Uh, I decided to start uh, saying no on the street. So I started taking these no's and spraying them on the street um, by adding messages to them. So the different notes are starting coming out of the book. And uh, these messages um, 
were re a representation of what I was seeing in the past nine months. I, I saw a lot of uh, police brutality, a lot of uh, violence on the street, uh, tear gas, uh, people being killed, people being blinded, people being shot. So the no was a reaction uh, to what I was seeing um, in my newsfeed. I hadn't done art for a long time by the time I went to the streets. So for me, it was like, wow, here I am drawing for a reason. Because before that, it was art for commercial purposes, murals and uh, illustrating. And, and now I teach yoga. So it was quite dormant for a while. I wasn't really painting. And it meant more to me to be painting for a reason, to put something out there that's urgent, that people need to understand, that's fast. So if I have skills of being fast, then here's a way I can use it. It just seemed right and useful, and a way to express myself that uh, felt uh, satisfying at the time. That has probably minimal impact on the world at large, so. I like the idea of art being about ideas, about messages, changing the way people think. Um, just an urge to do something, to, to express something without words, something that could be universal. It was more to do with my frustration as a human being, and I have an artistic skill, so I was uh, thinking, okay, here's something, a little thing that I can do to express uh, this opinion that is shared by many. When we were young, we were working on the street. So we were working on the street, and we were working on the street, and we were working on the street. So I was able to work on the street, and I was working on the street, and I was working on the street. في كراستي لكن ما روحش اشخبط في كراستي اللي جنبي يعني انا على طول بشخبط في الكتب وفي حاجتي بشخبطها كلها بس فكره بقى انا اروح اقف على الحيطه وابتدي اشخبط وانا مش عارف الحيطه دي بتاعت مين انه انا ببقى معديه من مثلا من, من الشارع ده كل يوم في الزمالك في اي حته انت ممكن تتخيلها ومعديه الحيطه دي فاضيه وانا عارفه ان هي فاضيه وبعدين تاني يوم اعدي الاقي مثلا حاجه زي بونوكيو والتلفزيون وفي عز ما كان التلفزيون بيكذب فاللي هو بسط جدا واحس انه في حد ماشي مع افكارنا يعني ما ماشي بينور لنا يعني او حق او في زي حد تاني بيتكلم جنبك يعني الحيطه دي كان مثلا الحيطه دي حد وانا مش عارفه اتعامل معاه فهم شجعوني بعدين انت برضو يلا ورينا هتعملي ايه وكده فرسمت بقى الجمجمه و... وال... 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 بالورده دي كانت كانت فكره والجمجمه انا كنت حاسه طول الوقت ان الجماجم هي اكتر حاجه مفروض نشتغل عليها يعني انا كنت حاسه ان انا لو هشتغل على الجماجم بقى ايه بمسخرة كده اللي هو بما ان احنا كده كده ميتين فبنتقمص بقى دور الهيكل العظمي بقى ونبتدي نتكلم كده واحنا فارغين تماما من اللحم <تصفيق> ومن ال... ومن الاحشاء ومن كل حاجه فري كده حاسين احنا فري نقعد بقى ايه نعمل جرافيتي بيتريق على كل حاجه زي اللي هو الجرافيتي بتاع بتاع الجمجمه وهي ماسكه العينين كتير وبتلعب بيها كده تحس ان هي هتلعب بيها كوره عادي يعني خلاص العينين راحت واحنا ممكن نلعب بالعينين و... وانتوا نور عينينا وكده يعني طريقه بقى على كل حاجه يعني انا بالنسبه لي الجماجم ف... يعني لو انا عندي فتره جرافيتي هكمل جماجم يعني فكنت مبسوطه جدا بقى ان انا بخترع بخترع حاجه Street artists came out and what they started to produce was a highly charged uh, politically and the messages were uh, against the incumbent regime they were anti mubarak Many of the murals also serve as memorials to those who were killed. So the street art then becomes a kind of entombment or a shrine to the deceased. And oftentimes you also see quite overtly pro-female messages as well. And so you feel the sense that the street art is there to make certain claims, political claims. So this is an important turning point for Egypt 2011 because non-regime sponsored messages and images uh, started to pervade public, public space. On February 11th, um, 
it was a magical night. It's uh, a surreal on all levels because we believed that, that it's over, that now we can actually start building a new Egypt. And that uh, now that Mubarak was ousted, a new Egypt was born. So I made it a point to take my two daughters and their grandmother down to Tahrir Square. Even though it was so crowded, it, people were crazy all over the street, but I wanted them to live that moment. And I told them, even though you're very young, but this is historic and you need to witness it. And I took a photo of them with their grandmother in Tahrir Square on that day. And I drove them back home and I put them to bed went back down with my husband and we stayed till four in the morning uh, celebrating this event. It was, it was like a big party. Uh, there were fireworks, people were dancing, people were singing, people were kissing each other on the street, hugging strangers on the street. It was like nothing we have ever felt before. Uh, it was the real, it was a moment of real liberation and real uh, freedom. Those 18 days were the most beautiful days in my life, I think, because uh, it was a utopic society in that square. We were, you know, people from different backgrounds, different ideologies. Uh, I think there were no class uh, barriers. Uh, we were all just one, you know, Muslims, Christians, women, men. I wasn't that surprised when he was ousted. And once he was ousted, I wasn't really part of the celebrations either because the army came in that day and I, I, did, I, I didn't think that was it and it succeeded. I was sure that there was much more to unfold and, and that it wasn't time to leave the square even. So when the news broke out, I cried a lot and it was like a release. There was a catharsis that happened, but I was very aware that uh, I did not feel the need to go and celebrate with the rest of the crowd in Tahrir. This wasn't the time. Uh, media does not necessarily always highlight the role of the women, but in Tahrir and during these 18 days, they, the women played an even stronger role in a very chauvinist society um, where men were, were demonstrating to look on their right and their left and find that women are chanting just as loud and facing bullets just as fiercely. This came to the forefront during the 18 days. Uh, society really became equal uh, in those 18 days. It be, Tahrir became an oasis where a module of what we would dream Egypt would become. The thing is, the, the image that I had of of women in general, you know, you say they're weaker and uh, they wouldn't stand uh, standing in the in the streets. They wouldn't stand the uh, gas bombs and everything. And uh, that was not the case. They, they they were much stronger than us, you know. And they were the ones standing there, and and you feel ashamed. You stand there and you feel ashamed if you cough or something or you run. You look at them and they're standing there. They're standing there and and they're doing everything that you wish you were doing, and then, uh, like, it hurts, you know? Uh, it, it hurts your, your, you say, I'm a man, you know, I, I should stand more than that, I should be stronger, I should support them strong, uh, strongly, and then you go back, you know? So, uh, what happened was, was, uh, uh, was beautiful, and they, they stood there. When Mubarak stepped down, we all had very high expectations and women felt that this was a new chapter. But then very quickly, they were, their hopes were dashed and they were disappointed because uh, uh, when SCAF formed a committee, it was a committee of wise men to, to chart the way forward. There was not a single woman there. And then when we went out to celebrate Women's Day on the 8th of March, and to demand equal rights in the square. We went back to Tahrir Square and we were attacked by a mob of men, you know, asking us to go home. And that was shocking uh, because we somehow had expected that things would change for women in this country. Our first parliament had only 2% women representation. Also the surge in sexual harassment right from the 11th of February, February when there was a mob attack on Lara Logan, the CBS reporter. That was shocking. Uh, then came the virginity tests on the women protesters. 17 women uh, had 
virginity checks performed on them to break them and humiliate them. There was a lot of brutal attacks on women, specifically targeted uh, sexual uh, harassment, very aggressive campaigns in Tahrir and around Tahrir, clearly to intimidate women from going down to the street. Um, because uh, we knew that they were targeted uh, specifically at intimidating women because of the monstrosity of the acts and uh, how organized they were and how varied the targets. So they would rape a, a very young child, an, a, a nine or a ten year old, and an old woman. So they did not differentiate an age. It was not about uh, uh, a specific profile, they were just raping women um, in a very systematic, aggressive way, uh, very uh, brutally. And, and that scared a lot of women. And we were in the war, it was very difficult, but it was like the war of the people in the street, it was like the war of the people that happened, it was like the war of the people that did the war, with 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 the war. This is a part of the war that we got into it. وبعد فترة تحرش بالبنات بقى الموضوع أسوأ يعني بقيت أخاف جدا يعني بقى عندي رعب شديد لأني شفت حالات بشعة أنا ساكنة في محمد محمود كنت بشوف الناس لما بتتقلع في محمد محمود وتختصب وتموت البنات اللي كانوا بيموتوا كانت الفكرة إن دول اللي إحنا بنناش دعوة بيهم دول الشعب والشعب بيعمل كده في البنات وإحنا بنناش دعوة وده مش حقيقي دي عملية عملية منظمة جدا واللي عاملها هم الأمنجية ومعروفة يعني فهي الفكرة إنه I had read an article about uh, how these men form circles around the victim. It's a very organized uh, type of harassment done at certain times during protests. So I really wanted to show that this was done also on Muhammad Mahmoud Street. It was very famous for that, that area for finding women getting harassed. So I wanted to show how organized it was. The women here should feel uh, attractive when they walk in the street and they shouldn't be harassed and men should be more respectful and it would be great if we all had a spray can and we could, you know, spray them away like flies. It would be great. So uh, I was hoping to, yeah, to even destroy the stereotype of, oh, she's asking for it, look how she's dressed. So therefore, that, that was my anger at making her look really, you know, high heels, lipstick, whatever they consider too much and just put it out there and make her look uh, confident and strong. I was hoping, you know, to make a woman tower over these small men. The assault on women was very aggressive. And this is when I decided to spray the cat. Uh, because um, in Arabic, otta is also a term. Uh, it has some sexual connotation when a, a guy calls a woman on the street, uh, otta is also. So I thought I would ask the cat to rebel this time. So I started spraying the cat also on the street as a symbol of the woman that will rebel. To encourage them to keep going down to the street, to keep owning the street. So rebel cat came in that con context to, to remind the women that uh, you need to be down on the street. You are half the society, so your voice is important. You need to keep rebelling. The army was trying to, uh, to catch some protesters and this young woman who was there uh, protesting was caught by three military men who tried to drag her and she was wearing, she's veiled and she was wearing a abaya that covers her body. Underneath the abaya she was wearing nothing, it's her right, it's her body. And when the, when the army person pulled her he opened her, he stripped her of her clothes and her, her blue bra was exposed. And her face was never shown, but what we could see on the video was the, the policeman uh, uh, stepping on her with his military boots and beating her. And it was a very graphic uh, video to see her body violated and uh, beaten so brutally. Um, the, re the reaction to it was, was, uh, was because there were 
so many other things compiling, but that video specifically, you, you come to a point where one thing happens and you feel like you can't take it anymore. I decided to capture that specific incident by painting the blue bra on the streets of Cairo uh, to remind us of the shame that we felt as a society when that woman was humiliated. And this, this video, when it was seen and shared, uh, a lot of mass uh, protests by women uh, went down to the street to uh, one of the chant uh, lines that they were chanting was Banat Masr Khat Ahmar so the girls of Egypt are a red line so it, they said this is where you stop you can't this this has gone too far um, and they had all of these creative beautiful chants on the street about um, about the importance of women and their role in society and their role in the revolution uh, so I was not the only one working on the blue bra. It captured the imagination of many artists and there's a lot of artwork that was done on it. All I did was, was simplify it and spray it on the street as a reminder. Nefertiti with a gas mask as a call. It says build on history. So <laughs> it's, it's building on a very iconic historic image of women, of Egyptian women. And the ga adding the gas mask immediately tells you that she came to life. She's part of this revolution. She's still alive. She's still around us. She's still here. And these women who are coming out are just an embodiment. So it is an extremely intelligent um, um, visual. And the fact that it's still on the wall till today says a lot. It says that the story will continue, that the story uh, is yet to be concluded. Uh, when you walk up in Mahama Mahmoud right now and you see the Nefertiti, it's, it's burnt and full of like, uh, uh, bird shots and everything. You have the bird shots and you have the fire on it and everything. It really serves the cause. It's uh, the Nefertiti has revolted, and and she's still standing there two years after, and she's still strong. And for me, the the image itself of Nefertiti, it's it's much more stronger right now. That's the reason that Mohammed Mahmoud is taking a little bit of time to paint or that he is taking الموقف بتاع الجرافيتي بشكل اقوى ان احنا ابتدينا يعني نستلهم ناخد من ال... في التاريخ المصري كله سواء كانت مصري قديم سواء كانت في الفتره بتاعه الاقباط سواء كانت في الفتره بتاعه المسلمين ففي النهايه انا بح... انا بدافع عن دوله عمرها اكتر من 10000 سنه ولا فعشان كده هم يقولوا اسلاميه قول مع نفسك اسلاميه بس انا ما بدافعش عن مصر تبقى اسلاميه اسلاميه دي يعني ده عمر صغير جدا من العمر بتاع مصر فانا ادافع عن الجزء ده ليه انا بدافع عن كله يعني على بعضه يعني بدافع مصر من اول المصر القديم لحد اللحظه دي فهي جواها كل اللي حصل ده ف um, in the case of Bahia Shahab and many others um, these are also either historians or they're acutely aware of history and for them pharaonic Egypt is a marker of the longevity of the history of Egypt. So when they bring back, for example, images of Nefertiti or wall paintings from pharaonic times, or in the case of Bahia Shahab, these kind of chiseled calligraphic words that mean no, uh, they're actually turning a very contemporary revolution into a historical event. They're very much aware of the historical import of that revolution, and they're using historically significant vocabularies to make that point.
The first person to call for prayer was, uh, his name was Bilal, and he was chosen by the Prophet because he had the most beautiful voice. Um, unfortunately, throughout history, women were never allowed to call for prayer. Um, in mosques, they have their own space, and they are not allowed, their voice is considered something that is uh, sacrilegious to share with a wider audience. It's, a, it's something that they should keep for themselves. So um, even if they are reciting the Quran, it should not be in a very singing, loud voice as the men do. So the call for prayer idea that uh, was part of an exhibition uh, commissioned for a museum in Denmark um, in that exhibition, I was highlighting the minarets of, of Islam and how these were lost. And, and these minarets were painted on a, on a very uh, long wall. To go with these minarets was a call for prayer that I recorded using the sound of a young mezzo-soprano from the Cairo Opera House. Um, and she sang it in a, in a very beautiful, um, enchanting voice. Um, the message was that it is time now for the feminine uh, to rise. It's time for the voice of the women uh, to be heard. I think the revolution uh, provided this space for women. It was like an, it's an outburst of creativity, of talent, of passion. The fact that these women were no longer, you know, the b fear barrier gone, and they're not afraid to express themselves, uh, they have found their space and are finding it every day. I think that space is growing every day. One of the chants that was raised in, on the street uh, is Saut uh, al-Mar Thawra, and it's, it means the voice of a woman is a revolution, and it's in direct retal retaliation to some parties in society who say, specifically Islamists, who say that the voice of a woman is a awra, something again that should be covered. And women, women retaliated to that by saying that the voice of the woman is a revolution. Um, a lot of artists again have contributed to that. One of them is Dua Al Adl with a brilliant uh, cartoon where she captured the the, the gagging of the mouth of one protester in front of the presidential palace. She captured that moment and she highlighted the fact that their, her voice is the, is the revolution, is the real revolution. Uh, when I came out, بصراحة يعني كان كان يعني كل حاجة بتحصل ما كانتش لطيفة ولا هو فجأة كده حسيت إن أنا هو أنا خايفة ليه ما استبيع استبيعت يعني ده مش مهم يعني إيه هيجرى يعني هيجرى إيه أسوأ من اللي جرى يا الله يعني كان حالة استبيع مش حالة شجاعة شوية وبعد كده لما بتيت أرسم وحس إن التجربة ما فيهاش أي خطر بتيت أحس إنه تمام يعني ابتدى بقى تظهر الشجاعة يعني الاستبيع ثم الشجاعة ثم السعادة <تصفيق> Maybe what we didn't realize is that we all had a dream for Egypt while everybody was in Tahrir. We did not necessarily all have the same uh, dream. And this is the phase that we need to move on to, is, is trying to find one vision for Egypt, is trying to paint her in a new image that most of the people in society agree on. Because you had the Islamists who imagined a veiled Egypt, you had the liberals who imagined a free Egypt from, free from everything. So we realized how, um, how far the spectrum of our dreams were. But that does not mean that these 18 days did not unify. And women were, were really important. Women became equals in the fight. Women were fighting the same fight, chanting the same chants in Tahrir. Dilwati, 
يعني انا كنت بعدت كتير عن الرسم فترة فانا بحاول ارجع للرسم وبحاول ارجع للرسم عموما مش شرط في الشارع يعني انا عن نفسي ارجع تاني ارسم بورتري وارسم فيجرز وارسم لوحات كده زي اللي كنت برسمها في الكلية بس انا حاسة انه انا فكري دلوقتي اختلف يعني ايام كلية احنا كنا دماغنا كده محطوطة في صندوق ومقفولة ومفيش اي افكار بس انا دلوقتي حاسة ان انا ممكن اعمل حاجات كتير حتى مش مش عشان انا استفيد منها ماديا يعني going down to the street came at a point where I felt I do not want to be a, a historian anymore I don't want to be someone who's simply documenting as important as I feel it is to document but I wanted to be part of it I, I live in Cairo and I felt the need to be part of what was going on around me and I have two Egyptian daughters and they matter and their future their future matters what they what they want from their country matters so going down to the street was a very conscious decision i know the consequences of of being on the street and i choose to go down to the street consciously because i believe that now is the time for us to um, to speak now is the time if if we don't voice our opinion now when will we do it مش مش خايف على نفسي انا كشخص ما يفرقش معايا لكن يفرق معايا الحاجات اللي احنا بنعملها يفرق معايا ان انا ان انا افضل مكمل يعني بس انا شايف ان انا يعني في حاجات كتير لسه ممكن ان احنا عايزين نعملها في حاجات كتير عايزين نقولها بشكل مختلف في حاجات كتير جدا نفسنا يعني The no is constantly coming back to me. I think the no project will, will keep, will live on. It's a thousand different no's. It's, I have a thousand bullets to shoot anytime I want. So, and this gives me a lot of confidence uh, to know that there's always um, a project that I can always communicate with on the street. It's just been the same mechanism over and over again. Cycles and cycles, same, same thing, same regime. Are you hopeful? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm observing. I'm hopeful once I see people move and uh, get out and be more aware of things. That always brings hope. But I think with that comes some kind of danger. I'm not sure, but things have not really changed that much. We're more oppressed now than before. Cairo is a very grey city. And um, every time I visit Cairo, I feel like I want to clean all the balls and clean all the trees uh, and clean the river and clean the cars. <laughs> I just feel like everything needs to be cleaned. And I think this, this grayness, this, uh, this dullness reflects on the lives of the people living in the city. Um, and I think in that sense, art is very important uh, because if, if you're surrounded by this grayness, then it will reflect on you. And if you are surrounded by beauty, it will also reflect on you. And with that thought, I think art is important. And that's why we go down on the street. That's why we keep painting the street. Um, because um, art has the power to change the lives of these people that are on the street. And it is their lives that you want to change. So by adding color to the city, by adding ideas to the city, by interacting with the people is how I think change will come and how you will influence their minds and change their minds. I don't think in our lifetime we will live to see the Egypt we would like to see. I hope that in their lifetime that this Egypt will exist and that what we dream of today, what we plant today, the seeds that we sow today will grow and they will reap its fruits. Um, I doubt we will benefit from what we are starting, but we are starting and it's their job to continue the story, to keep writing the story.
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة Hello. Thanks a lot for both the presentation. Thank you. And for allowing us to see the the film. Um, I'm sure there's there's plenty of questions and and comments, um, but I have some as well. So I'll I'll, I'll just open the floor. Um, and of course, there's. There's so many uh, topics uh, or themes, um, both in the presentation and in the film, uh, that somehow uh, contributes to, to discussion we've already had uh, since this uh, since the morning, um, and in, in of course in a certain sense, both the the works. We've seen you have done, and uh, the other works that were presented in the film uh, straight away go uh, directly to, 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 to a question about art and the role of art, uh, the relationship between art and politics. Um, because of course, um, it's it's difficult to to come up with with uh, better contemporary examples of some kind of political use of art. Um, so I think that, I mean, we should of course talk about that uh, and perhaps uh, perhaps start there, the, the question of the relationship between art and, art and politics um, in this specific setting, but of course also um, try and, and, and address or compare to, to different uh, historical contexts or other contemporary contexts. Um, but in a sense, the kind of like the the the, the immediate uh, question I was I was thinking about when uh, when seeing the film, uh, but also listening to your presentation, uh, would be something like: um, Is it is it art, or is it 
is it art and is it is it relevant to 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 talk about these creative protests or this kind of creative dissensus as art it's not an um it's not an incident in a gallery on its own and this is what we always uh, need to keep in mind that what was happening during the the revolution is uh, is a tool we had a tool like the same way so you have a situation you have a square full of people who are being shot by a regime and you have you have the choice to stay sit on a couch and watch it on a tv or you can join it and what was happening is that professionals from different fields were joining the revolution so it started with the doctors and the medics and the these were the people who went uh, first to the to the square and then the lawyers joined because they were trying to get these young kids out of prison but then after a period of time it it was ongoing and as artists we felt obliged to be on the street and our tools were messages so we are part art is part of society you can't take it and and criticize it uh, without its context, at least, in, uh, at least for us in our situation, the context was very important. Um, but in in a in a sense, um, I mean, we, you you could also make the argument that that uh, as you stepped onto the streets as artist or as uh, um, people gathered in Tahir Square and being doctors or whatever, uh, that that um, what actually took place was something different. Uh, I mean, that, that's perhaps what, I, what I'm trying to, to get at with the question, is it art or is it relevant that it's art or or how are we supposed to talk about it? Because in, in, a, in a way, um, I think the most powerful uh, framing of of what you were doing would be to say that it stopped being art somehow. That 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 what what took place was was that 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 uh, when you decided to leave the couch or, or, or get out of, of uh, the gallery or the university, um, the kind of like the specialized identity as an artist or a teacher or a doctor or whatever actually was replaced or submerged into something different. So, so, so what you became were Nefertiti's daughters, all revolutionaries in, in a way. But when, you're in, when it's happening, you really don't think of yourself as, as anything except a member in a community who wants to help. So maybe it's, this comes later with, with people who are reflecting. I always thought that we will never understand the, the revolution except maybe 50 years later because it was so intense. And there were so many things happening that we didn't have time to process. We were reacting to situations. So people get killed, we go out to the street. People get killed, we go out to the street. And it was a cycle for two years, this was ongoing. So again, it was to us it was a reaction and not a, a planned... Um, because but the regime later comes on and says we had agendas, we were funded by foreign powers, uh, this is foreign money, we are being paid to be on the street. So, and to us it was simply a human reaction. So, is it art, is it activism? I don't know what you want to label it, but to us it was only human to do what we were doing. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, I think we, I, I completely buy into your description. Um, I mean, what it was, was it was revolution. <laughs> And the revolution is a spontaneous event uh, where, where kind of like the the ruling order and the the identities uh, that characterize the ruling order somehow disappears or gets challenged somehow. Um, and that's of course also, I mean, it's interesting then that 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 art uh, becomes a powerful tool when it somehow change changes into something different. Uh, and, and of course, that we, should just, we, should, we should keep that in mind or try to uh, be aware of 
of that process or, or, or that change somehow. Um, but and of course, there's 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 there's, there's plenty of, of questions that that then has to do, of course, with with the question of of uh, of these institutional settings. I mean, what what does it mean for us to sit in the couch <laughs> and and talk about these questions in the street art festival? Um, but I think I I also wanted to to um, to talk about um, kind of like the present situation, of course, because uh, in in the end um, you talk about the revolution as a, as a dream in a certain sense, as a dream. The, the I mean, the occupation of the square as being somehow an an alternative society that's that's being created by everybody present, uh, and of course also. Um, all of these different dreams that are somehow uh, channeled through the protest uh, and and kind of like the, the development after the January Revolution, of course, shows that there was there was a number of different dreams or at least different attempts to to try and perhaps highlight hijack the dreams of of the protesters on the street. Um, but 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 the, the the big question would of course be is is there still a dream? Is the dream still alive? Uh, the dream both of, I mean, the revolution, but of course also this, this strange uh, process, that, that, that process that, that took place where art fuses and, and somehow becomes connected to uh, an accelerated political process. I think what the most important uh, gain we got from that uh, the experience of the revolution is the awareness that um, everywhere you go there are uh, dreamers. Uh, and to me, being in a community like this one, to meet someone like Carrie and other artists who are fighting their own different battles, it confirms the fact that I don't think it's only a local issue. Maybe our dictator is just more blunt in the way <laughs> our government is present, present but there's uh, actually injustice everywhere around the world and this is why my work now is not only concerned with my locality um, it is in Arabic but most of the messages reflect um, us as, a, as mankind uh, and the realization that we are actually in this together um, and The learning is what's important. The knowledge that it's possible to do something. We, we didn't have that before. We were extremely oppressed. 50, 60 years of um, military dictatorships. Um, and now you look at the younger generation who grew up watching the revolution on the, on the screens or participated in any way. They know that they can change now, the idea is present. And I think this is why last night the Fight Club was interesting, because we need to evolve into something different. Um, if we are to change what we had, what we discovered is that being on the street was very good to intimidate the regime, to scare the regime. But if we didn't have a plan of what we want to go to do next, you can't really change things if change is ultimately what you want to gain. Being only on the street or just sp spraying messages on the street is not enough. We need to organize and have an agenda and plan it. And it's nice to see how different artists here already um, are thinking of a political party and of other ways of being involved in society and not just be an artist, you throw your message and you run away, but how can you actually impact that change? So for me, as a teacher, I teach it in the classroom, even if it's for a small number of students, um, even if it's very small steps, it's, um, it's better than leaving the country altogether or committing suicide or being in prison or... So, the ideas are what's important. This is our gain now.
And what what would I mean if you if you should uh, try to characterize this? I mean, the, the situation in in uh, in Cairo or or in Egypt is, um, of course, as as we already saw in the film, uh, in a certain sense, the 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 revolution. Uh, was hijacked in a certain sense, uh, or at least was confronted. The revolutionary process was confronted by two counter-revolutionary forces. On the one hand, the, the, the established powers, with the military, of course, as, as, as one of the, the, the primary subjects, and then um, the Muslim Brotherhood and different Salafist uh, groups were somehow able to. I mean, they, 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 they. they you, you, I mean, I think it would be fair to say that they, they are the second counter-revolutionary force. Yeah, and they were organized. This is what they had. This is the advantage that they had over us. Um, the intellectuals, the artists, the people who want change, we hide and we think and we read and we, but we don't take these ideas and actually take them out to society. We stand on a, you know, on a podium and speak to the people but not really integrate and make uh, changes on the ground. The Muslim Brotherhood have been working for decades and when the chance came they were ready. So this is why they were uh, able to to have a chance at probably running the country. But not, I mean, the deep state was there even for them, so. Yeah, and, and but, but and that's of course the situation right now. Although there's there's, there's strikes going on in Mahala, and I mean, so so uh, as a, a kind of because what you are in a way describing uh, also in in this setting is is the existence of a kind of of a of some kind of dream, or that that that, that there are actually some kind of critical mass. Um, even even in a place like Stavanger. Uh, among middle class artists um, but um, but is, is, is isn't revolution going to happen when uh, thousands of people just so all of a sudden happen to find themselves in the street because uh, the military has uh, stopped uh, has raised gas prices or food prices or stuff like that. Um, isn't isn't that somehow kind of like the, the the basic process that takes place, and 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 then it's so to say our role as middle class artists or art historians or whatever to to submerge ourselves into that process. But 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 before that process takes off. Um, of course, we have to prepare and we have to come up with the right analysis. And we, I mean, but 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 that the ability or capacity of art to actually make some kind of change is is does it, does it exist? Yes, of course. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't believe art has the power to change. So um, yes, but again. Um, so you have a government and you have the people who are requesting something from this government. Um, and to at varying degrees, you sometimes get what you want and sometimes... But why should our demands be only about bread and gas and, and um, basic living standards? So I think it's relative depending on the country. It's, we can't really compare. I just think we all have our own different struggles. Um, but art is definitely a tool that can help us um, drive society um, in different directions. So, okay, that's that's uh, perhaps a good place to to get some some questions or comments from the audience. Um, in Ukraine, we have like. Uh, Two revolutions, you know, and I can say that after revolution of this kind, you have a huge disappointment 
you say the, the, the children are rising uh, with the thing that they can change something, but at the same time, they're rising with the thing that it doesn't work, you know? Um, for, I'm uh, a little bit afraid of this thing, because with every revolution, uh, disappointment becoming more and more. What about the disappointment in Egypt? Yeah, but you, I, I don't think, we had a very high rate of uh, suicide after the revolution among the young. So yes, it's, it's true. Uh, as, you, as you saw, lots of people also left the country. Um, but there will always be somebody in society who will think that I can change things. And if we leave ideas that somebody before you tried, maybe they can take it from there and try to do something else. It's you just lay the problem on the table for someone else. It's like writing a book. You write a book, you leave it on a shelf. It might collect dust for 20, 30 years, but there's one day some one person is going to be interested in that topic. They will take that book off the shelf and they will do something with it. So I, th I feel that it's our duty just to leave books on these shelves and hope that one day people will <laughs> read them. <laughs> It's a, thank you for this question. It brings back a lot of nice memories. <laughs> Actually, it started with the youth, and the te they were all teenagers who were stuck in the square. And they started calling their parents. So their parents were the professionals who started joining. And then after the parents were the doctors, and then the lawyers, and then when it took longer, we, it was winter, and when we couldn't help, we would send trucks of blankets and uh, food. And companies started sending juices and milk, and so people started sending supplies to the square, even if they were not going. So it started with a group of very young people getting stuck in the square. And then people started coming from the provinces, from outside of Cairo, Rami Isam, he just came with his guitar and he stayed in the square for four months. So it's, it was really people who believed, who believed in the dream, who started just coming. And social media was amazing in, in helping us organize. Um, we learned a lot from each other, how to avoid tear gas, where the tear gas was being sprayed, what to do when you're gassed, what to do if you're shot uh, by bullets, so social media helped a lot um, in that process. But it all started with a group of young people. So, so it started like that. Yeah, <laughs> it always starts like that. Yes. Uh, was there any art that was done by the, your opponent? Of course, the regime is always a creative, very. The regime covers. <laughs> yeah, you could tell the walls that the regime covers because they only cover the artwork. They leave the shitty, dirty wall as it is and they just cover the artwork. And there were some people who, were, who would spray messages with the regime. I don't know if they were part of the regime or just, I mean, community members who were, members who were supporting, supporting the regime. But it wasn't really very creative or attractive, so for sure. <laughs> uh, one small question. Uh, in the movie you 
said uh, that this revolution, it's not for your generation, it's maybe for your daughter's generation. Can you explain us why, do you think? Because we realize how um, deep the corruption is. You see the mountain and you see how far the, the climb. Um, it, and the corruption, because we removed Mubarak, but the system of, of corruption was still in place. So you, you have the ministers, the ministers, uh, the supporting uh, the ministers, the, the doorman at the door uh, at the ministry who doesn't clean the glass properly. So corruption runs really, really deep. And you have to go to every layer of society and clean it. So you, I, I just feel like we need to restart the whole, like <laughs> reboot the whole system. And it's not going to, to happen maybe. Not, I, now I don't even think my daughters will live to see it. I, I think um, it's going to be a very slow and painful process. And uh, I'm hoping it will not be bloody, but sometimes I feel maybe it should have been. It's unfortunate, but I really can't think of... Um, it's really difficult to fight for a peaceful revolution when you see, when you see so much aggression and uh, brutality in, and the torture. It's they, they they break the prisoners, the political prisoners. The the techniques that they used are they they come out completely damaged, psychologically and physically. Um, so sometimes you feel maybe it's difficult to remain believing in peace when you see so much cruelty in the world. I really have no answers, um, but I think. What, what consoles me is that we had the honor of trying. So for me that was, uh, I, I, this is how I live. It helps me, so, um, it helps me go by, that at least it was a historic moment in time and we had the honor of trying. I don't know if others will try in the future, but we tried. I'm here. <laughs> so maybe I'm not trying in Cairo, but I'm trying in other cities around the world. And with the internet, it's amazing. I paint a, a wall here, and all of the Arab world can see it. So fuck borders. Uh, um, late last year, there was a the book published called uh, Morbid Symptoms by a Lebanese Trotskyist professor at SOAS in London, El Shiba uh, Akar. His, 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 he's written uh, several books on, on, um, on uh, the Arab revolutions. He, he, his first one was called Le Peuple Veux, The People Want. And his, uh, it's, it's an attempt to try to, to end on a, on a positive note. His, his, his uh, analysis is, uh, of course, that, that uh, the last 40 years, uh, the socio-economic uh, development in, uh, in Egypt, but also Tunisia, North Africa, and the Middle East has been so bad that although the counter-revolutionary forces uh, no doubt has been able to, to derail, derail the revolutionary process in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, of course uh, also in Syria and Yemen, etc., the, 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 the socio-economic contradictions are so dire that it will not take as long as, as we probably think. Uh, but of course, uh, the, 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 the picture he's painting is also that, that uh, uh, the counter-revolutionary forces are so intent on not uh, kind of like uh, handing over power that, that it will uh, probably be... Uh, a really, <laughs> it will either self-destruct, but also that the, the, the confrontation will be really, uh, really violent. I guess um, all scenarios are possible. I, I don't, I don't doubt that as 
because I lived the civil war before. I saw, I saw it firsthand. So, um, and still, nothing good came out of that. The country is still. I mean, I speak of Lebanon. So, the country is still economically unstable and really very uh, unfortunate. But um, I don't think, um, I don't think it's predictable. Really, I don't think we can really predict what will come next. We know that we have a decaying, sy decaying systems. They're archaic in every sense. What we discovered during the, the revolution is with technology, we were much faster, much more connected, much more organized than the government. Uh, so there are new systems emerging. I'm not sure we will be ready to I would like to think of parallel governments that are being formed, and that's happening in the private sector a lot. But I'm not sure how that, I mean, they stopped all of the NGOs in Egypt this year, no NGOs allowed to work. So they're trying to cripple the process in any way possible. But I still think that there are a few enlightened individuals who have foresight and who might be ready with solutions. I see it in the educational sector. I see it also a little bit in the health sector. So I'm hoping eventually we can have, I don't know, parallel governments or parallel solutions that will be ready and organized by the time the system crumbles. I hope it will not be more blood, but I, nobody can predict. Yeah, nobody can predict. Um. But at least you tried, as you said. But but um, I think we'll, we'll we'll wrap it up and give a big thanks and applause too. So, thank you all um, for being there for this great day. Um, tomorrow, don't forget today we have at 19 hours uh, in Saving Banksy, a movie premiere, um, Scandinavian cinema, SF Kino, I don't know if you locals know, or, and um, well, uh, and then we have tomorrow, tomorrow uh, there will be, uh, as you can see in the program, other things in plus, but the Seminar itself it begins at twelve. So at twelve here it's the time, good timing for the for the for the be again here for the seminar. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>